podcast. You're listening to the Premier Rockets podcast. It's H Town Hoops, hosted by Brandon Scott and Adam Spolane. That's right. It's H Town Hoops podcast. Brandon Scott here with Adam Spolane, Austin Mendez producing this thing for us behind the scenes. We appreciate y'all for joining us. We have not been with y'all since the end of summer league. I think we only on the podcast really covered that first summer league game. It was the one where, of course, Jabari Smith Jr. had the game winning shot and Amon Thompson got hurt. But a lot has happened since then. Obviously, Cam Whitmore became the summer league MVP. And uh and we're we're now like into the offseason, like past the offseason point, like like into like preseason, you know, training camp not too far away. So we're gonna get into a, a couple of things, but Adam, man, it's just good to good to talk to you. We're talking to Adam, fresh off of uh, watching a little bit of a World Cup, watching the uh, covering a little bit of Astros. You've been knee deep in Astros, man. Are you are are you recovered from that playoff atmosphere that you covered uh, over the last couple of days? That, that, that's what it felt like. Did the did the Astros Rangers series feel like the 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 bubbling of some type of rivalry with these teams actually being good at the same time before we get into Rockets? Uh, I don't know about rivalry. I just think it's two teams, two competitive teams. I think that's all it was. I just think that you have two teams that are trying to win the division and those games mattered and it got a little bit heated and it was enjoyable. Like, you know, it's, it, it, it sometimes can be hard to get excited about regular season baseball in July. You know, you're just kind of like trying to cross games off the list, but those three games were fun. They were fun to be at. Um, there was some anticipation, for that series, the first two games were excellent, and then the the last game last night was not great, but it was still entertaining. <laughs> there were still some entertaining moments in it. So, um, it uh, the one weird thing about the Astros over this six seven year stretch is that they've basically been locks to be in the playoffs. They have won the division pretty easily, aside from the the weird twenty twenty year, which doesn't really count. Um, this year it's going to be different. This year. It's going to be a battle both to get into the playoffs and win the division. And I'm looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to the games in September mattering because the last couple of years, it's been more about let's just cross these games off the schedule and get to the postseason. Now the postseason isn't guaranteed. So it uh, it's going to make for, I think, a fun last couple months of the year. Yeah, I, I just think that it's cool that the Rangers and the Astros are good at the same time because that's a rare thing. And as far as just those last few games or just specifically that last game where the Astros get blown out. I mean, that's the type of stuff that I want to keep me engaged in a blowout. Give me some give me some shenanigans. Give me some some antics and some personality and some flair. And so, like, I actually liked all of it objectively. Like you could argue the pettiness of it and the silliness of it. But I was I was entertained by all of it. So I thought it was I was trying like to it. Yeah. Yeah. If you're. If you're if you're gonna give if you're gonna give me a blowout or you're gonna waste our time, at least give me something to at least give me something to be entertained by. They gave I, they gave that at the very least. I think if it's a ten run game and the bench is clear, they should just call off the game and everybody go home. So yeah, that's my yeah, well, that's the next job, Manfred rules change. Yeah, well, and, and 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 maybe maybe we can get a run rule in there somewhere, and maybe that could be instituted as part of it. Ten ten runs or more plus a bench clearing equals run rule. Everybody gets to go home and be happy um but yeah look so with this rockets offseason man i want to go over some of these betting odds because i was looking at them over at DraftKings, and of course I, you're a betting man and i'm not really but both of us know that betting odds are a pretty cool interesting way and window into talking about a team but i wanted to just get your impressions about the offseason overall now that we've had a chance to lay our eyes on some of these players specifically Amon Thompson for a game at least and then Cam Whitmore was able to play throughout all of summer league I know neither of us wants to make too much of summer league but now that we're at least at a point where all the 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 pieces for the most part are in play and we've got to see see them a little bit what sort of your overall impression of what this Rockets offseason has been uh it's been a good one I, I don't think it's been a great offseason but I think it's been solid to where um, they have they they raised the floor of the roster, which I think was important. And we saw this um, last year. They were playing a lot of guys who just should not have been in an NBA rotation. And I think we know that because 
you look at what you know john uh, and i'll put it this way jonathan fagan talked to stephen silas at summer league um and within the story he mentioned that you look at all these guys that stephen silas had to play especially towards the end of last year josh christopher Dacian Nix, Ty Ty Washington, uh, Usman Garuba, KJ Martin, and KJ, you kind of separate KJ from the other four, but those guys were basically not just given away, but the Rockets had to attach assets to get rid of those guys. And those are the types of guys that Steven Silas was having to play. Those were the types of guys that they had to play last year. That's not the case anymore. Like this roster should be better. The the top nine, 10 guys in the rotation should be much more. I shouldn't say, I, I, I guess you go like six through 10 on the roster should be much, much better next season than it was last season. So to me, that's where I think the success of the off season comes in. It's just like you, hopefully you won't have bad players having to play serious minutes or bad NBA players play real serious NBA minutes. Yeah. For me, Adam, it's just, it's just direction. I feel like they were a directionless team in the past or for the last few years they have been and with the additions of Ime Udoka and Fred Van Vliet and even Dylan Brooks to some extent I feel like the team just has a little bit more direction and organization if you will it was a they were disjointed or or and dis, or, disorganized I would say unorganized I would say for quite some time and I think that's going to change that's the big part of it um, I, I think that that still there is an element of, and you and I have talked about this both on the podcast and on the air on shows that we've done on sports radio 610, but like this feeling of underwhelming of how, how much better does this ultimately make you? And it really puts the spotlight for me on the young pieces. Like, like we can talk about all the additions, but to me, it's all going to come down to how those young pieces ultimately end up developing and meshing in with the new ones um the the found the foundational pieces how they end up meshing in with the new ones i was looking at a headline earlier adam and it was uh it was austin Reeves, i think on the who's hype podcast or on some podcast or another or maybe, maybe it was a different one but either way he was talking about how you know and we, we know this that the supposedly the rockets were interested in in austin reeves and they were kind of waiting to see how the Fred Van Vliet thing would play out. And I just, uh, you know, you talk about what ifs and we'll get into some what ifs throughout the off season or, or throughout the preseason and leading up to the season. But what if Fred Van Vliet doesn't go to the Rockets and they're offering Austin Reeves, a hundred, essentially a hundred million dollars or something close to it. You know, I think about that, like I, I'm underwhelmed now. Imagine how, and that's no disrespect to Austin Reeves. But imagine how underwhelmed I'd be if like you're kind of if it's like some combination of Austin Reeves and Dylan Brooks and you're like, now it feels like we got a bunch of redundant players and, you know, it, you know what's the direction? What are you doing here? You know, like you got Udoka. But so I, I think about what could have been versus what actually is. And I like how the pieces fit. I like what it represents. I like the direction. And for me, Adam, it's going to come down to. Like Jalen Green, for example, how does the additions of obviously Ime Udoka is the head coach, but how does the additions of Fred Van Vliet, a true more, I don't want to just say traditional, but just a maybe probably just a more effective and veteran and experienced point guard, winning point guard, and Dylan Brooks, a high level defender and just an experienced player? How do the, do the additions of players like that impact him? How do the additions of players like that impact the Jabari Smith Jr., who we saw uh, play really well in summer league for whatever it's worth, um, looked more like, again, in summer league context, but looked more like the type of player that you'd want him to be. How do those additions impact guys like that? Alperen Shingun, what does it mean for him to play for a coach that is going to demand something of him defensively or possibly limit his minutes. I'm very fascinated to see how that plays itself out. So like just the direction, focus and vision of it all is what stands out to me in the offseason. Well, part of the direction is that now 
they're actually going to try to win games. And yeah. the last couple of years, they really have not. Well, I mean, they have it that they really haven't kind of, they have not at all tried to win games. It's been about playing guys who probably aren't ready uh, big minutes, whether it's green or Smith or Shingun or whoever, um, and try and maximize your draft pick. That's basically been what the last couple of years have been. Now it's about, we actually have to win basketball games. So I think that's where, the direction comes in because the, there's clearly a direction and it's from up above. Like, Hey, you know, the whole phase one thing was great, but now it, it's time to start winning. And so I think that there certainly was an urgency within the front office because they could have, you know, they could have just hoarded the cap space. I mean, they did not have to spend all the cap space. They could have just rolled it over the next summer in, in, uh, in, in tried their hand with the next free agent class. And they kind of understood that, no, we can't do that because we actually have to win games now. Um, so we'll have to wait and see how that part of it works out. But I think you said it at the very beginning. It's about the guys that they drafted. Like, you know what Fred Van Vliet is. You know what Dylan Brooks is. You know what Jeff Green is. You know what Jock Landell is. You know what all these guys are. But now, and they can be, they can be and have been important players on good teams, but they're not like taking you to some high level. They aren't, you know, they've been all, you know, at least in with Van Vliet, he's been an all-star in the past. I don't think that you would consider him to be like a perennial all-star type player. So you need guys that you already had to emerge as those types of players. And that's where the Jalen Greens and the Jabari Smiths and the Shingoons and the Easons and the Amen Thompsons, that's where those guys matter because the guys that they sign, they can help you. Like they are going to help them and they are going to make the floor much higher but they're not necessarily going to raise the ceiling. The guys that are going to raise the ceiling are going to be the guys that they have drafted either in the top five or in the top half of the first round or, you know, top 20 in the first round the last couple of years. So those are the key guys for them. It's just, can the, can the 20, 21, 22 year olds, can those guys develop and turn into upper level NBA players? Because if they do, then the Rockets are in business. If they don't, then the Rockets are just kind of going to be mediocre. All right, we'll we'll get into the young players and the fit and a little bit more about the team in a little bit as we talk about these betting odds. But before we do that, while we're talking about the offseason, I wanted to just mention this Jalen Brown contract because it happened. We've talked about Jalen Brown on this on this podcast before, so just to put a wrap on that, since that did happen in the offseason, uh, the the Celtics and Jalen Brown did agree to the five-year, $304 million super max, which, you know, you know what these numbers for the most part are going to be before they hit. It's just a matter of when, but even still, when you see it, you're like, yo, that's a lot of money. That is a whole lot of money. Uh, just really just your thoughts on the, the, the contract, the decision by the Celtics, and whether that's like uh, – you know, I don't want to say a missed opportunity for the Rockets because it's not like they could have just snapped their fingers and had Jalen Brown. But do you think it's do you think it's kind of a better do, do you like this the way this has played out better as opposed to sort of our Jalen Brown conversations previously? Like him him staying there with the Celtics. What do you think about that deal and the and the the Rockets implication? Well, I mean, the Celtics really didn't have a choice. They had to sign him. I mean, they I guess, you know, the alternative was to trade him, which you're not going to get equal value back for him or you lose him, you risk losing him in free agency. So um, they were kind of, their backs were up against the wall with this. Obviously he was somebody that we had connected to the Rockets really for months, even going back to Christmas as uh, somebody that they would probably be interested in targeting, whether via trade or in free agency, if he would have gone into free agency next year. And I still don't think you can rule that out. You know, as crazy as that might sound today after he signs, you know, uh, the largest contract in NBA history, which will only be the largest contract in NBA history for a short period of time. But for Brown, he's going to sign it because he's going to get the money. And if he would have gone into free agency next summer, nobody else could have offered him that. So he locks in the three hundred and four million. And as we've seen with the way this league works, just because you're under contract doesn't mean that you can't get traded. And Boston did what Boston had to do and that was sign him, but it doesn't mean that he can't be traded down the road. And I'm telling you, um, 
you look at the Van Vliet contract, like it would not take a lot for the Rockets to be able to match up the money to make some sort of a Jalen Brown trade. I'm just, let's just get that out there right now. Um, and so if, if Boston were to fall short next season, which I mean, they will probably go into next season as a favorite to win the Eastern conference, but if they don't and they lose early, like they have now the last couple of years, then all of a sudden, or at least like they, they did last year, you're going to start hearing that a little bit more. And the one thing that the Rockets did with their, with what they did in free agency is that now they have the contracts that you can add up to get somebody like Jalen Brown and they have enough draft assets to where I think they could make something happen if that were to come, if that were to be an option here down the road. So uh, we have kind of mentioned Jalen Brown in the past with connections to the Rockets. And obviously you have to cancel that out at least for a year, but don't be surprised if we're talking in 10 months about a Jalen Brown Rockets possibility here. Yeah, I, the the better way to frame that would, for me would have been to to put a pin in it, right? Because yes. you you can just put a pin in that because I was talking about this with a friend whenever the news came out that yo know, we have seen if there is any NBA trend that it doesn't take like a it doesn't even take the the hardcore, the most hardcore fan to follow this NBA trend is that you can trade bad contracts. You can dump salaries. It is a thing in the NBA. It's just, I mean, you it's doable. We've seen it time and time again. And so this wouldn't, wouldn't be any different. And, and Jalen Brown is still like, like he would have to really fall off a cliff to be the type of player that you couldn't move even with that salary. So, you know, like, so it, this is not, and he's a young enough player. So this is not like a end all be all sort of thing, but it it does. Uh, I think it does, like you said, it 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 does kind of feed the obvious of the Celtics needing to do this. I wondered, I, I wondered more of what the relationship was with the team and how much that was going to factor into all of it. That was kind of my thing of like, okay. This seems like an obvious play from a basketball standpoint of what they should do. They should run this back. They should keep trying this thing and trying to surround these guys with the the most that they can. But I didn't know and I wasn't sure of how Jalen Brown felt about being with the Celtics. And if the writing was already on the wall for what direction he was leaning in, if that maybe factored into what was going to happen this offseason. Now, obviously, we see how it played out. But that was why it was interesting to me. And, and obviously, again, we see how, how it's played out. But like we said, put a pin in it. Put a pin in it because the connection is there. And there's just like, you know, we make the jokes, and I, at least I, I participate in this, make the jokes about Jalen Brown not being able to dribble all that well and only being able to use one hand. But think about how cold you got to be to be an all-NBA player, to be an all-star, to be as accomplished as he is, even with the deficiencies that we talk about. Like that to me just tells you how damn good he is. This dude is this dude just made a, a three hundred million dollars and can only dribble with one hand. Like that is like credit to him, salute to him. Uh, I, I, I'm sure a lot of people wish they had it that good. Uh, so so yeah, I, I would say we could just for now put a pin in that. And and it's very easy to stack the contracts. Like you look at Jalen Brown's salary for twenty. Oh, I just had it up for um. 2024 2025 it is going to be and this is an estimate of it but it's going to be around 55 56 million with the van vliet contract and with dylan brooks and with all the veteran contracts that the rockets um handed out this offseason it's very easy it is very easy to come up with that so if just like you said put a pin in it because uh if whatever feelings that jalen brown might have had towards the celtics organization they might still be there. That's you know he signed the contract because it was there and it was offered to him, and yeah. uh, it's three hundred million dollars. <laughs> and and it, it's not like he could have just gone into free agency and gotten that from somewhere else. That's the big thing is that there was only one team that could offer him that contract. It was the team that he played for, and so you just have to take it. You take the money and you figure out you know you figure out the rest down the road. So I I do think that it is it's possible that that this could be something that we revisit uh, once we get towards next spring. So you and I both agree that 
the Rockets had a good off season. You know, it's it's not like overwhelming or anything, but it was a good a good solid off season. But we've also acknowledged that they're still not going to be a very good team, and they are a, they're even a long shot to to make the play in. You know it, that that would be almost you know that that's certainly aspirational, but you know it's it's, it's probably out of the cards. At, at the very least, the betting odds indicate that they are the least likely team in the Western Conference to win the championship. They have the uh, they have the worst odds to win the championship out of all Western Conference teams, and only the Hornets, the Pistons. And the Wizards have worse odds. Uh, if you look in the Western Conference, um, they're below the Jazz, Spurs, Thunder, and Trailblazers. So I'll start there with like these these odds on their 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 win total is it's thirty one and a half. Western Conference. Like, yo, is that is that good enough? I mean, like, I, I don't know. Like, I I don't know if if it's like fair to 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 say to to judge that just off of the odds. It's probably not. But you think about it, it's like, man, you make all of these moves, you make all of these advances in an off season. You'd like to think that you've raised your floor. You'd like to, at least I'd like to think that you've raised your floor a little bit more than that. And we talked about this before. Like, what what teams do we think that they're better than? And I don't know. You and I might have rattled off one or two, maybe. Like, we might have thrown San Antonio and Portland out there. The odds are saying that they're the worst in the Western Conference. What What, what do you think about that? Well, there's no reason to think that they aren't. I mean, they yeah. were the they they've been the worst team in the Western Conference now for. For three straight years, they were tied with San Antonio last year, and San Antonio just drafted, you know, a generational player. So, uh, yeah, I think that where they are in the uh, in the preseason rankings or whatever, that that's that's fine. Um, and it's also that's a ten win improvement, which te- you know, winning ten more games that's a that's a pretty significant improvement. And like you said, you made the key point. Like, who are they better than? Um, you're going to play 52 of your games against Western Conference opponents. That's a that's a big chunk out of your schedule uh, against teams that, for the most part, you will be worse than. I mean, the Rockets will play 52 games against teams that will that right now I think that we would all agree are better than them. So where are the wins coming from? I, we can talk about how they they've improved and they certainly have. And I think that organizationally they would be disappointed. Uh, if they only wind up, uh, you know, with 32, even though that would, you know, hit the over, but it's hard to make that type of improvement, especially when everybody else in your conference is trying to win, except for maybe one team, and that team is still at this moment, Portland, trying to win at this point, unless they they finally trade Damian Lillard. But yeah, I think that the number is fair, and I think that it's hard to they can talk about wanting to be in the play and all they all they want, but. You got to jump over a lot of teams in order to get there, and all those teams are good and trying to win. So it's the, the West. The West is back to being very, very difficult to the point to where remember it wasn't it wasn't long ago that you had to win like fifty games just to get into the playoffs from the Western Conference. I don't know if we're quite there yet, but you've got to get to 35, 40 wins just to be in the play-in conversation. I feel like. Yeah, man, it's such an uphill battle and and feels like such a a tough sell to the public. I I don't know how much this matters, really, because people who love the team are going to love the team more than likely. But it is frustrating. You got to think like such a tough sell to the public of selling. This is the year it, it changes or this is the year where we're serious. We're trying to win games. We've made moves. We've given 80 million dollars to Dylan Brooks. We've given somewhere around one hundred and thirty million dollars to Fred Van Vliet. Like and it's not it's not the fans money. It's not the public's money, but it does sort of represent what you're trying to do. And and then it's like, man, but you're still (laughs) you do all of this and you're still the worst. You know, I think they'll be much more enjoyable to watch. I think it'll be 
a like I said, a team with some direction, which is what they were sorely lacking. So as far as like a, an on court product, an actual tangible product, I think that'll be something that they can be a lot more proud of this season even if they're not going to win a ton of games even even if they do turn out to be the worst team in the western conference but to me it just feels like such an uphill battle in a in a weird position to be in when you put in this much work to try to improve the team you make two first round picks that are really that you feel really good about you sign two really solid veterans that should feels like should raise your your floor at the very least and and it's just like yo it still another year away still another year away preaching uh preaching a lot of patience there no you're right and that's why the timing of where they're at is so difficult like if it and i feel like if it weren't for owing oklahoma city their draft pick they could probably string this out another year they probably could have rolled the cap space over to another year but they don't want to have to give up you know, they didn't want to have to stare at the possibility of giving up a top five pick to Oklahoma City. So I, I understand where they're coming from with this, but they just picked the they just picked a bad time because everybody else in the West is trying to, to get better and trying to compete. They are too, which you know, I give them credit for for taking that approach, but it's gonna be hard for them this year. And I think the big challenge, and we'll probably talk about this more as we get closer to the season, but keeping everybody positive, I think might wind up being a challenge because There are these expectations that they're going to win more basketball games, but it's going to be really hard. So what happens if if they start poorly and all these guys who are who have either been used to winning the last few years with uh, with Brooks and with Van Vliet and all these guys, you know, what happens if they all of a sudden now they're in a situation where they're losing a bunch of games? And what about all these these other young guys who have kind of been beaten down the last couple of years? by losing all these games what if they're going through this whole thing again like how do you keep how do you keep the vibe in the locker room happy how do you keep everybody engaged how do you keep everybody positive and pulling it in the right direction and i think that's going to be the big challenge for Ime Udoka moving forward is like hey this is not you know we're we're saying all the right things and we're talking we're, we we are you know our actions are are doing the same thing but you still got to go out and win games and the team that's across from you they're going to be trying to win too, and they're probably better equipped to win games at this point. So how are you going to handle it if things don't go your way? How do you make sure that this thing doesn't go off the rails? Because I think that we've seen it the last couple of years. Their seasons have just gone off the rails in a hurry, and it's it's been tough for them to, to come out of that. So you know, it, this is – I think it's going to be a challenging year for them. Um, I think it's a good – it's it's going to be a good challenge, but I think you're going to learn a ton about the young guys especially. I think you're going to learn a ton about Jalen Green and Jabari Smith and Eason and Shane Goon. I think those guys – it's a big year for those four guys especially. Yeah, I, I like that point. I, I will say that I feel good about what you mentioned there, how they would respond to – the challenges of a season like what this could be to adversity how they might respond to that in terms of who they brought in the leadership that they brought in between Ime Udoka and I'll explain this between Ime Udoka Fred Van Vliet and Dylan Brooks and you're right about the young players I think that's what the ultimate question is going to be like how are the how are those guys going to respond and I was talking about the impact of those other guys those other three Udoka Fred Van Vliet and Dylan Brooks what's the impact on those guys on the floor what's the impact on those guys off the floor as well when things do go or sort of between the lines outside the lines a little bit when things don't uh go the way that they ideally would like for them to go but in terms of the guys that they brought in I do like their experience with adversity you know M.A. Udoka the one season that we've seen him as a head coach Obviously, the Celtics went to the finals that year, but they experienced some adversity earlier on in that year or around the midpoint in that year. They had a little bit of infighting. You had Marcus Smart not necessarily getting along with or or at the very least calling. I don't know about not getting along, but at the very least calling out some of the guys in the media. Uh, I think Jason Tatum and and Jalen Brown were two, were two of the guys that, that might have taken exception to it um uh, th- like they, they had to rally around each other there, there was some they w- they weren't doing that well at, at one point and then they turned things around and Ime Udoka had a lot to do with that uh, at least the way that I understand it and then Fred Van Vliet is somebody who even you and I played 
a little bit of this when we were doing a show on Sports Radio 610 last week of him talking on the Pivot podcast with uh, with Ryan Clark and some others about just the, the challenges of last year playing with young guys and how the experience of Toronto's failures last year, underachievements last year, how that, I don't know if failure is the right word, but under, certainly underachievement, how that made them uh, or how that experience could help him with these guys uh, going into going into working with these because he just came from working with young guys uh, and, and sees, sees how that went. So and then, of course, Dylan Brooks was on a team last year in the Grizzlies who, I mean, we remember that interview that John Morant before things went off the rails for him, that interview that he did with I think it was Malika Andrews, where he said we're good on the West. You know, they were cocky enough to think that they could win the West. And then they went through some adversity, obviously. Now, I don't think uh, all of that had anything to do with Dylan Brooks, but he he was a part of some of the adversity at times, right? So, he, like, so much so that they didn't want to bring him back and publicly did not want to bring him back. So I say all of that to say they brought in some guys who have dealt with adversity, uh, at least some of the leaders that we think are going to be on this team. Uh, the question is, and, and the thing that we're going to be, trying to monitor is how like how how do the younger guys respond and how do these quote-unquote leaders help them along the way with that yeah you're right and it's one of those things we won't we, won't, we aren't going to know until we see it and yeah. uh, I, I i remember jalen green said early last year you know we're in a rebuild there's no there's no there's no losses it's either wins or or learning lessons and, uh, you know, at some point, I think he got tired of the whole learning lessons aspect of it. Um, I'm interested to know, um, do they now feel like, well, now we have now now there are losses. You know, we're, we're not rebuilding anymore. Now we're actually like winning games and it's either it's wins and losses. And, you know, how do you handle the failure? Um, I, I, failure is hard. You know, it just is, especially when you're doing it on a big stage and um so I want, you know, I want to see how they handle that. And then at, at the same point, like, what if they get off to a good start? How do they handle the success? Because you have a bunch of guys who have not been successful, at least from a team level in this league. So how do they handle it when they start, you know, if they start winning games and, you know, do they stay focused and, and all the other stuff that comes with that? So um, the big thing when it comes to sports, especially at the highest level, it's how do you handle success and how you handle failure? And, uh, I'm interested to see how the Rockets, how this group handles both this season. Let me ask you, where do you think they improved the most? We've got, we've gone over it, but the most. If you could point to one thing, is it the is it something that we've already mentioned? Is it the direction, the leadership, the like? What what would you say if you could have one thing to point to? Where where would you say they improved the most? I just think it's the overall depth of the team. I think it's just the, you know, you look at who they were playing at point guard last year. It was Kevin Porter Jr. getting the the, the heavy share of minutes. And then behind Kevin Porter Jr., it was Dacian Nix or Ty Ty Washington or Jay Sean Tate had to be put in that role or Eric Gordon. You know, now all of a sudden you have like real point guards on the roster. You have more than just the one. Um, basically, I think, you know, your your center rotation instead of having Usman Garuba or Bruno Fernando in there, you're going to have you know a, a probably a quality NBA player in Jock Landale filling in those minutes behind Alperen Shingun. So to me, it's just um, raising the floor of the entire team to where you're not playing guys who you have to give away. Essentially, you're you're not having to give away guys on their rookie deals because they have no value and because teams just don't think that they can play in this league. So uh, I think just raising the, you know, making sure that that one through 10 on the roster are filled with real NBA players. I think that's the big uh, improvement of, of this off season. Yeah, I would agree with that for the immediacy. And, and that's what, what matters most just like what's in front of us. But I would say the thing that I think will ultimately be the answer to this question I think it's going to be the drafting of Amon Thompson. Like, I think he's the, like, overall the best player that they added. Like, he's not the best player right now, but as far as ceiling and the potential contribution to the team and what he could represent to the team, like, I think within, you know, by the time he's going into year three, like Jalen Green is going into year three, I think you could be talking about him being the, you know, at least one of the top two or three players on the team. And you would hope he would be that 
uh, for as high as he was drafted. But I, I think that 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 that's a, a realistic projection and, and not just like, hey, because he was drafted there, but hey, because he's really, really good or could could be really good if he develops the way I think that he can. Like it's it's ba- for me with Amon Thompson and this is just kind of paying more attention to him since they drafted him. It feels like there's enough raw ability and enough intangible to go with the raw ability to make it seem like it could improve to like the, the what the, the wherever his shortcomings are seems like things he would either work on or try to compensate for. So so like I I really like the bones of what's there with with Amon Thompson as a draft pick, even if I don't think necessarily he's going to be the biggest co- contributor this year necessarily i think it's possible it's, it's there like the potential is there but just overall drafting almond thompson and even cam whitmore to, to some extent i think is gonna but but to a lesser i think is gonna really help this team down the road well it's the obvious thing you know you when you, know, you want to be able to say that the number four pick in the draft is the best guy that you added in the offseason but I think now as we are, what, a month removed from the draft at this point, you look at the guys that they couldn't. Uh, Victor and Brandon Miller and Scoot Henderson, that Amon Thompson was next. And so clearly I think that they took the right guy. And also just taking the pick turned out, I think, to be the right decision because you know, after the lottery, we were talking about that. Well, maybe they should trade the pick. Maybe they will trade the pick. And I think that as we look back on it now, keeping the pick turned out to be the right decision. So I think that the way the Rockets handled the disappointment of falling out of the top three in the draft, I think that that should be considered a success of this offseason because they could have done made some sort of a panicky move. They could have drafted the wrong guy or, you know, or whatever. But I think that we can both agree that a they they made the right decision by keeping the pick and then they also made the right decision by taking who they took in that spot what would you say is the biggest failure i feel like you and i are going to have probably the same on this one but i'll let you go first what would you say is the rockets biggest failure of the offseason i think it's probably just the return for kj martin Um, and I think that this kind of falls into the bigger, I guess it's been kind of a buzz phrase of the last month or the last four weeks or so has been like asset management or whatever people have said with just kind of how they handled some of the trades that they made to try and create a little extra cap space or a little extra flexibility. Um, and, and I'll get to that in a minute, but, um, to me only getting two second round picks for KJ Martin's a little bit of a failure. Uh, I think that he's just a better player than that. And at that point, you're probably just better off holding on to him and trying to figure something else out down the road so to me it was only getting the two twos for kj martin yeah easily to me it's easily that i would just echo everything you just said about kj martin and and would reiterate if that's all you're gonna get for him he's worth more than that to you on the team just like as a player to me it is just worth it's worth it more. It's more worth it to find minutes for KJ Martin than it is to just give him away for two second round picks. And that's not to say that KJ Martin is like some franchise player or anything, but he is a a solid rotational player on a team. And it's like they were just almost like they were just trying to give him away. Uh, I do wonder how much of it was perhaps KJ wanting a new start and, and how you know teams try to work with players sometimes. But even if you're going to do that though. You can't punt like that. It can't look like that. Uh, so that that part of it was disappointing. Um, the I never – help me talk through this, Adam. I never fully understood what happened with the Brooke Lopez left them at the altar after they had already agreed to – send ty ty washington to atlanta or whatever like to me there was something there was some type of asset asset mismanagement that happened there with the with creating space to get brooke lopez that didn't work out that seemed like it was perhaps unorganized and i never felt felt like i got the full explanation of it well they clearly thought that they had a deal for brooke lopez i think they clearly thought that they were going to sign him and that they had a deal agreed on 
with him and then he backed out. But in order to make the deal happen with Lopez, they had to create a little extra cap space. And so what do you do? You wind up trading, you know, guys who are easy to trade. And for them, it was the three uh, former first round picks with Christopher Garuba and, uh, and uh, Ty Ty Washington. And they had to give up stuff to get off those contracts. And it kind of shows you that those guys just didn't have a whole lot of value. I mean, they were basically yeah. negative value players at this point. And I know that that's kind of upset some people and, and it's made people feel like that, you know, they mismanaged, you know, the assets or whatever. But I think that you can probably say that those three guys just weren't assets. And I, I think that we, we, people value first round picks and first round picks are certainly valuable. But to me, a first round pick, especially a late first round pick, it's kind of like buying a car. Like you buy a car and it has its value when it's brand new and it's on the lot. And then the second you drive it off the lot, it, it it immediately starts depreciating in value. You look at a first round pick, especially a late first round pick. Once that pick is made, it basically, if the player doesn't immediately start to perform now, all of a sudden the value of the player, the value of the asset, it, it, it uh, depreciates. And so that's what happens is that, um, the, you know, Josh Christopher and, and Usman Garuba, those picks, they had value. But as soon as you see those guys on the floor, especially in year two when they didn't really perform, you know, they're just in a whole lot of value there. And they had guaranteed contracts for, for this yeah. season. And, yeah, and then, there's, no, there, there's no question I would say, like, to your point here, Adam, the idea of a first-round pick and what the first-round pick actually turns out to be, always the idea is better. Right. The, yes. the concept, the concept of the first round pick, as opposed to who that for like flip the card over and who is the first round pick. Give me the first round pick. And normally it doesn't sound as good as first round pick sounds. Well, because most of the time those picks fail. Right. And you, I think the one that probably bothered people the most was Ty Ty Washington. But again, he's the 29th pick in the draft. There's not a whole lot of value at 29. And you saw him last year, and I know he did a couple of things well, but he did not scream, you know, quality NBA player to me. You know, he just didn't. And maybe he will be some sometime down the road, and maybe I'll be proven to be very wrong when I say this, but that's just that's just how it looked. And um, he was guaranteed a contract for next season, and it's highly unlikely that you know, he's now, you know, he's been flipped to Oklahoma City since this. Um, it, it's hard to think that he makes – Oklahoma City's team next season. So um, in all likelihood, he's going to be a free agent pretty soon, or he's going to, you know, he's not going to have his third year option picked up. So you're asking a team to take on guaranteed money. And so sometimes there's a price that that comes with asking a team to do that. So to me, the, the smart thing to do, you know, going back to the 2022 draft was just get out of the first round. You know, there's no, you know, you don't really need the 29th pick in the draft. You know, it's like I said, like we talked about, it's, it's great in theory to have that. It's great to say that you have, you know, all these first round picks, but if they're falling at 29, the hit rate on the 29th pick in the draft, it's incredibly small. Like they just don't hit all that often. Basically, you know, picks that are guys that are picked outside the top 20, don't hit very often. So that that's why the Rockets handled the Eric Gordon trade the way that they did, because they could have traded him um, and maybe gotten a late first round pick. And they would have had the, the pick from Milwaukee, which wound up being 30, but clearly they kind of understood that moving up from 30 to 20 had a whole lot more value than just taking on another late first round pick. So that's why, you know, they, they did the pick swap for Eric Gordon. So it just kind of shows you that first round picks are nice, but as soon as you as soon as you pick the player, the value of the pick just evaporates almost, especially if that player doesn't perform right away. I'm convinced, Adam, that the Ty Ty Washington trade outrage, if you want to even call it that, was a direct effect from Dacian Nick's PTSD. I think that's what a, a, a lot of it had to do with the fact that. It felt like, and, and not, it, it didn't feel like it was, and became clearer and clearer over time that the Dacian Knicks thing was a bit of a waste of time. Like, like, do even though Dacian Knicks was a year ahead of Ty Ty Washington in terms of the acquisition, you know, being being brought in and and Ty Ty being drafted, 
there's probably this feeling that they should have flip flopped the way that those guys were used and prioritized, and that at the very least, people would have liked to have known how good of a backup point guard would Ty Ty Washington have been, how good of an overall player would he have been. And there's this feeling amongst a lot of people, and I like them too coming out of the draft, but there's this feeling that, hey, that you really either missed out on something or at the very least even missed out on truly and properly evaluating. But but I would say that in the games that Ty Ty Washington played in, good or bad, there was nothing that he really showed that was like, hey, this is not a player that you can't trade after his first year uh, or going into year two. So, But I do think it, it's, a, it's a combination of things that they – that they mismanaged the point guard, particularly the backup point guard situation so badly last year. And then you end up giving these guys, not just giving these guys away for nothing, but having to attach assets to it to do it. But I, I think they thought that Dacia Nix was a better prospect. And you read the stuff a couple of years ago where they were yeah. basically, they, they were saying that Dacia Nix would be a lottery pick if you were in the draft now. And I don't think that anybody would have said that about Ty Ty Washington. And so I just think that it was more of, they valued Nick and the, the one thing that you always heard about Nick's um, was just how good he was in practice. And I'm telling you, I had people uh, in summer league last year, 2022 summer league telling me that they thought that Nick's would wind up taking the starting job from Kevin Porter jr. Like that's how highly um, they thought of Dacia Nick's and it just didn't happen. You know, for whatever reason it did not happen. He just turned out to not be a good NBA player. But uh, I think that, you know, they're telling people that they thought that Dacia Nix was, was, would have been a lottery pick and they wound up taking uh, Ty Ty Washington at 29. So I think it's pretty obvious they felt that Nix was a better prospect and had a better future in the league. The, that's why he was getting the minutes ahead of, ahead of Washington. And also I think they wanted Washington to play in the G League. And, you know, that was a decision that, that they made organizationally where they just thought that it would be better for him, better for the team moving forward if Washington were playing in the G League. So I, I I think there's been a lot of blame put on Steven Silas for this. This was an organizational thing. You know, this was, you know, how the Rockets valued Knicks and they really liked him and just, it just didn't work for him. So um, again, he's, he was, Ty Ty was the 29th pick in the draft. Those guys aren't going to hit very often. And I know he was a big recruit out of Kentucky, but you know, he got passed over 28 times in the draft out of, you know, after playing uh, on what, one of college basketball's biggest stages in the SEC and one of the in one of college basketball's biggest programs. So uh, I don't think that, you know, as much as some people might have liked Ty Ty Washington, I just don't think that there was the value. And you see it by just the fact that they had to give up assets just in order to, to get him off their books. I had some more bed knives that I wanted to run by you, but we've already run long enough. Let's let's revisit some of them when we do our player previews uh, we're going to do a little bit of that um of course we're a couple of months away from training camp we got a while so we'll we'll have ways to to fill the time and to do it in a fun and entertaining way uh so so let's let's pick that back up next week uh, when we talk again we're going to do some player previews uh, look at some of these bed nods that I was talking about because we we did the the wins the the over under on the win total the thirty one and a half discussed that uh, but there are some specific to players some of the awards and and things like that where some Rockets names pop up in interesting places where we could mix that in with some of our uh, with some of our player previews so let's do that pretty soon um looking forward to that man look this was good this was this felt good to get back in the get back in the mix man i know uh i know we've been we've been pretty busy man we didn't get to go to summer league man but we were doing radio for a full week and then uh after the all-star break uh eventually you end up getting that that ranger series that we talked about with the astros so uh and of course as you know and i saw you out there at training camp i think on wednesday i don't know if you're out there third i saw you out there i feel like one of those days it's the only day you're not going to see me out there anymore yeah man I gave look you, give you one day that's it let me tell you man you got the better you got the better assignment right that right now and you you know that pretty damn well uh covering sports uh indoors dude i do not understand let me just get this off right now man i do not understand for the life of me why we are outside like that i don't 
Because Ask Tamika. That's the but, but but this is the thing, and I could, but it's it's always been that way, always not just not just exclusive to the Miko. All the coaches have always done it that way. Meanwhile, they got that big old bubble sitting right there with the air conditioning in it. It's huge. It fits everybody in there. COVID, nobody. There's no COVID restrictions anymore. We're way past that, and and even before then, before COVID, they they just like to practice outside. I don't get it. I understand wanting to uh, develop some kind of level of toughness or whatever, but it's not even like football is even played in weather like that. Like meaningful football, by the time you're playing meaningful football, it's cold. Like, like what? What? Why are we? Why are we doing this? I don't understand. It. It doesn't. It doesn't prove anything to anybody, or do it doesn't do anything for anybody. I'm just so confused by it. Like, hey guys, why don't we go inside? High school is one thing. If you don't have the facilities, that's one thing. If you don't have the money, that's one thing. They do. And I don't get it. I don't get it for the life like that. <laughs> Yo, ask, you gotta ask that question. What is that thing over there? That that air conditioned thing over there that's just like who's in there? <laughs> what are they doing in there? Can I go cover that? <laughs> Whatever's <laughs> happening in the bubble. Anyway, man, we'll be back with y'all next week. H Town Who's Podcast, Adam Spillane, Brandon Scott, Austin Mendez producing this thing for us behind the scenes. Rate, review, subscribe, tell your people. See y'all next time.